On December 19, 1944, the advance guard of Kampfgruppe Piper would seize the village of Stomon and take, according to American estimates, over 200 prisoners from the 30th Infantry Division. This famous footage shows German soldiers celebrating their success while speeding the POWs to the rear, where they would be initially held at the Chateau de Foicourt. Part of the chateau is now an Airbnb called the Falcon's Nest. The third-generation owner, Francois, whose father and grandfather fled as the Waffen-SS closed in, has preserved a fantastic bit of history. In the bedroom of the Falcon's Nest are three inscriptions from the American prisoners. One of them has a name, Robert Morgan, from El Paso, Illinois. A couple that stayed here was able to contact his relatives and afterwards sent Francois a letter, which he has placed on the wall. As for the Kampfgruppe, it was the last time they could pat themselves on the back while having a smoke and a beer. The US Army was descending in force. This is episode 9 of the Battle of the Bulge, Gotterdammerung. On the afternoon of 18th of December, while Piper with his advance force waited out the American air attacks in this bunker, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Franklin and his 1st Battalion of the 117th Infantry Regiment were pushing into Stavlo. When it reached the area of the Market Square and Ferdinand Nicolay Avenue, it squared off against six Panzer IVs, some King Tigers and two platoons of half-track mounted pioneers. This group of Germans was desperately trying to catch up with the advance force. Most of the force got through, but the Tigers had problems. The one commanded by Lieutenant Jürgen Vessels took fire and, in trying to escape, backed into a building, forcing him and his crew to flee. Another Tiger was disabled at the south end of the bridge by the air attack, which for a time blocked the way for the following tanks. The fighting in and around Stavlo would hang in the balance for several days, but by that night, the 30th Infantry Division had made it impossible for the supplies Piper desperately needed to get through. What did get through was over half of Nittel's reconnaissance battalion, which assembled in the area south and southeast of La Glaise. Piper's force was running short of fuel, but he was determined to continue the advance. The retired British general and historian Michael Reynolds estimates that Piper had with him around La Glaise only one-third of his tanks, six Tigers, 19 Panthers and six Panzer IVs. With his headquarters at the Chateau's farmhouse, he developed a plan with four key tasks. First, continue to defend Cheneux. Second, Nittel would attack to reopen and secure the route to Stavlo. Third, the Tigers and half of the Panther tanks, those of the first company, would defend La Glaise. And fourth, attack with the remaining Panthers and infantry towards Stomon. As we discussed in the prior episode, the 30th Infantry Division was moving to the Malmedy area to defend the northern shoulder of the Bulge. On the night of 18th of December, the 119th Infantry Regiment established its headquarters at Stumon Station, which is 4 kilometres or 2.5 miles west of Stumon. Lieutenant Colonel Fitzgerald's 3rd Battalion established defensive positions in the village. He would receive reinforcements of two platoons of Shermans, five tanks per platoon, and a 90mm anti-aircraft gun, which would serve in an anti-tank role near the church. In the frosty dawn of December 19th, the German forces embarked on their offensive, departing from the shadowed confines of St. Anne's Woods. Their contingent, though formidable, was limited in number, just six Panther tanks and a pair of Mark IVs treading along the road. South of the road and on foot, 
moved the 9th SS Panzergrenadier Company, a small detachment of pioneers and even a handful of paratroopers that were still tagging along. Piper kept a few Panthers and half-track mounted infantry as a reserve force. That morning, Piper's most significant force multiplier was a dense fog that limited visibility to 50 yards. If you have ever served in an armor or infantry unit, you probably have seen how an attacking force taking advantage of dense fog can get right on top of the defenders before they know what hit them. That is exactly what happened, and after a short mortar bombardment, the Germans routed I and K companies. As the lead panther rounded the corner, the 90mm gun knocked it out, bringing the attack to a halt. In a rage, the panzer battalion commander, Major Pechka, got the force moving, and the anti-aircraft gun was soon destroyed. Piper would recommend him for the oak leaves to his Knight's Cross. Piper would write. He climbed out of his tank, grabbed a Panzerfaust and threatened to knock out his own tank crews who would roll a single step to the rear. This brutal measure was decisive. By mid-morning, American resistance had collapsed. Fitzgerald's 3rd Battalion would report 290 casualties, of which only two were killed, 20 wounded, and the rest were prisoners or missing in action. The Germans claimed to have destroyed four of the Shermans. After getting his forces sorted out, Piper ordered the advance to continue. This attack consisted of only seven Panthers, the 11th Panzer Grenadier Company in half-tracks, and at least one Flak Panzer IV. This small force moved out about noon on the winding road to the west. As the force approached Stumont Station, a 90mm gun destroyed one panther and damaged another. The other tanks neutralized the gun and the advance continued. However, the 1st Battalion of the 119th Infantry had recently established a strong defensive position just to the west and was reinforced by the remaining Shermans that had retreated from Stumont and four M10 tank destroyers. As the German column rounded this bend, the GIs hit them with a classic anti-tank ambush. Captain Bud Strand, the commander of D Company, would write, Around 3 p.m. on the 19th of December, we could hear German tanks ahead of us, coming down the road towards our position. We were dug in on the curve in the road with our tank supports and waited. When the Panther tanks came round the curve inside of us, our tanks cut loose at them. The shells hit the cobblestone road and ricocheted up under the belly of the tanks where their armor was thin and they exploded. This is the battlefield marker that signifies the high water mark of Kampfgruppe Piper. For the next few days it could only fight for its survival. To support the channel be sure to like and subscribe and also check out my new Patreon which will have exclusive content on it two to three times per week. Content that you ain't going to find anywhere else on the World Wide Web. And also what I'm trying to do is for each video have a complementary and supplementary map that supports that video content. For instance, this is an interactive map of where the vehicles were found destroyed around the La Glaze area. You might be asking what source did I use to build that map? Great question. Some of you may be familiar with this former magazine after the battle, uh, which was published in England. These magazines have now been condensed into books. I'll have a link in the description of where you can find them. Top notch. When I was in the Ardennes last year, this was what I walked around with. For those of you who are interested, I will see you at the Little Bighorn Battlefield 25 June 2024. I've already made reservations to be there and can't wait. All right, Charlie Mike, continue the mission. The Americans now began planning their counteroffensive. Major General Matt Ridgway arrived and took command of the 18th Airborne Corps, which consisted of Jim Gavin's 82nd Airborne Division the 119th Infantry Regiment reinforced with tanks and tank destroyers, 
which became the 119th Regimental Combat Team and Combat Command B of the 3rd Armoured Division. Ridgeway's mission was to destroy Piper's forces north of the Amblev and prevent any crossings of the Salm River around Trois-Ponts. What about the area around Stavlo? Throughout the day, elements of the 1st SS Panzer Division tried to seize the bridge, but failed. American M-10s knocked out Tiger 222 on the south side of the bridge. As you may recall from an earlier episode, this is the famous tank from the captured German footage. At 19.30 hours with heavy fire support, a squad from the 105th Engineer Battalion blew up the northern span and rendered it useless. There was still one bridge for the Germans to use, however, it could not take the weight of tanks. Early on the 20th of December, Kampfgruppe Sandig was able to get a couple of companies across to reinforce Piper. It was too little, too late, as Task Force Lovelady would slip through a gap in the German forces and reach Trois-Ponts. The task force was in a precarious position, but it had cut the road to La Glace once and for all. On the 21st, the fighting continued without let-up. Paratroopers from the 504th seized Cheneux. After hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the Preventorium in Stumont, the Americans gained control of the village. After these setbacks, Piper circled the wagons in La Glaise. He would leave both his wounded and the American wounded at the chateau. On the 22nd, the U.S. Army tightened the noose around La Glaise and beat back all attempts to break the siege. Isolated and hammered by artillery, that evening Piper requested permission to break out. It was not until the afternoon of the next day, the 23rd, that he received approval. So, after passing on the necessary orders and destroying their remaining vehicles, at 2 a.m. on the 24th, the remaining 800 men of the Kampfgruppe moved out on foot, leaving behind the wounded and roughly 130 prisoners. Only one American prisoner went with the column, Major Hal McCown, the former commander of the 2nd Battalion of the 119th Infantry. Major McCown would escape during an encounter with a patrol from the 82nd Airborne. Piper and most of his men would make it back to German lines. But how? The new Allied commander of the northern shoulder of the Bulge was British Field Marshal Montgomery. In a move that is still controversial, he issued orders for Ridgeway to withdraw his corps and form a new defensive line to the west. This movement opened the path for Piper to escape with the loss of only about 30 of his men, and on Christmas Day they linked up with elements of Kampfgruppe Hansen. The remnants of the 1st SS Panzer Division would withdraw and take part in the fighting around Bastogne. As for Piper, he would resurface in February, once again as commander of the division's armoured battle group in Hungary. On the 10th of May, an American patrol arrested Piper in Bavaria. He would be charged as a war criminal and face trial with 70 of his men for the accusation of murdering 460 American soldiers and 106 Belgian civilians. In a future video, we shall dig into the trial and its aftermath, but that is for another day.